Hello boys and girls, are you sitting comfortably? In that case, let's begin. Young Mr O'Sullivan and myself thoroughly enjoyed chatting with our eclectic mix of guests from a convicted murderer trying to make it on the outside to Andrew Ridgely opening his heart for the first time about the mercurial success of Wham and the tragic passing of his school friend and bandmate George Michael. All the way through, it does, they, they do seem to come quite effortless, effortlessly, the, the, the songs. That's the way it comes across from the book. Uh, they did to a degree, yeah. Um, the, the songs that got assigned... Um, Ram Rat, Top Tropicana and Careless Whisper were the first three songs that, that George and I wrote. It's not bad first three, is it really? <laughs> no, no. No, we, 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 had, we got off to a good start, that's for sure. Um, uh, but they were the first three songs that we wrote post the, the folding of um, The Executive and they weren't even three fully formed songs. The, exe the demo we did was some of Wham Rap, most of it, and then a bit of Kelly Whisper and even less of, of Club Tropicana. So um, uh, they, how we thought that was going to get us, I really don't know, but you know, we were obviously um, very pleased with what we'd done, so felt it was, it was good enough. There isn't a hint of envy, jealousy, resentment, and not a hint of it in the book. And I think that that's quite... A remarkable thing. But normally you think in bands there's envy, there's resentment, there's... What do they always say? We split up over creative differences and such. You seem to be... You were a genuine friend. You, you were happy to see him fly. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I I don't suffer with, with jealousy. I mean, Clearly. I was, I was envious of his talent. Uh, who wouldn't be? But, but I never let that um, in any way um, cloud... Uh, my our friendship and uh, and I was very happy for him to to you know I conceded to the release of Careless Whisper as a as a George Michael track because uh, I understood that it was his uh, perfect chance to to establish his first foothold in uh, as a solo Quite artist. Remarkable. It wasn't a shock. It was a surprise. It wasn't a shock, and it wasn't and it but it didn't change anything. Um, you know, it had no real consequence to our relationship um, whatsoever. It was it was immaterial. Um, obviously, you know, we both understood that it was it was something that uh, he wasn't prepared to to make that public. Um, why why was that? Because it was at the time. At the time, it was a fairly easy going. He's where it was a fairly easy going time in the early 80s, or a fairly accommodating. Well, in. Poor, poor, I mean. Uh, well, I, in, it, it wasn't in the terms of um, the press response. You know, gay men, uh, gay you. people were, um, were still um, under. They, they suffered yeah. a lot of uh, vitriol and. and um, they were marked out as as a target. I think could be. Some were, some weren't. But I no, think... you're, you're you're right. I was thinking more sort of the club. The actual yeah. music scene was very accommodating. Yeah, yeah, but you're, you're, I mean, you're there, right. there were plenty of gay people around. Um, but and the the musical com music community uh, embraced those people. And, and uh, but it was a very different kettle of fish with, with regard to the um, the national press. You know, Elton suffered. Yeah. Uh, um, Freddie was hounded, uh, and that would. That would have been the same for George, really. He, he, when he did finally, when he was outed, you know, he didn't. He never voluntarily. Uh, um, he didn't volunteer that. Uh, in and that was in the late nineties, um, when he was when, when he was sort of outed. He's, he's attracted a lot of um, uh, unfair and, and unjust, unwarranted uh, uh, attention. Our regular oddball feature, Curiosity Corner, made a welcome return this week when we spoke to 12-time world record holder Joe Atherton, a world record holder not at the International Athletics Meet at Doha, but fresh from victory in Worcestershire, where he'd grown the world's biggest turnip. Congratulations as well, because your latest record uh, was achieved this week, is that right? It was. It was at the three-county showground at Malvern. OK, and, uh, and what were you showing there, Joe? 17 different kinds of veg. OK. Uh, t talk us through them, if you don't mind. Uh, runner beans, beetroot, potato, onions, <laughs> cabbages, cucumbers, tomatoes. 
I can't remember the rest. The, the, the vegetables, general vegetables. Yeah. Are they all massive? Is that is that your speciality? Yeah. I grow giant veg. Grow giant veg. Now, um, if you, I, I don't think you'd have heard the very beginning of the show, but years and years ago, 25, 30 years ago, I met a bloke who grew massive, uh, what are the things? Marrows. marrows. Ma massive marrows. And I was trying to do a deal for the Sun newspaper to take the dry seeds from the massive marrow and give them away so that you could grow a big one with the sun. Is it as simple as that, Joe? Is it just a case of getting the seeds from one big plant, planting them and hope that you get another big plant? No, you've got to be you've got to be dedicated. It's no good just plant the seed and leaving it. You've got to look after it. Uh, does it matter? I mean, do you need a winning seed to start off with, or can you make any seed a massive vegetable? No, no, you've got to have the right strain of seed to right. start with. Okay, so your turnip, which won the wor uh, record world record this week, yeah, for the longest. H how long was it? 4.064 metres. Now, that 12 and is, a half feet. That 12 and a half feet. That is a massive turnip by, by any stretch of the <laughs> imagination. <laughs> um, how much of it is below the ground and how much of it above? <laughs> There's none below the ground. I grow them in guttering. Ah, to keep them uh, what, away from predators and such like? Well, the guttering tends to train the plants to go down. Ah, to keep it nice and straight, presumably. Yeah. Right. And now, one of the things I've heard from people I've spoken to in the giant vegetable world is that there's a lot of competition between people like yourself and I've heard of sabotage and such like being done. Is, is that true? No, not that I'm aware of. In the giant vegetable world, uh, most of us make a family. OK, OK. And are, are you the biggest name in the in the giant vegetable world at the moment? I wouldn't say so, no. No, mm. there is... Um, there is other growers just as, well, famous as me. OK, OK. And what is the... What is the proportionally the biggest vegetable hit you've had? Is it your turnip or is it something else? I once grew a long beet grew 26 foot. <laughs> 26 foot. <laughs> I hate beetroot as well. 26 foot. Dear God, that's amazing. Here's Kirsten for you. Joe, as a fellow northeasterner, I've got an issue because I grew up calling what is a turnip a swede and a swede a turnip. Oh, amateur. Are you with me on that? Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes. Yeah, there is actually a class for the heaviest swede in the show. Because I think a turnip is orange. That's what I, I no, you see. No, that's what no. we in the, in the North East call is that right? a turnip. Oh, yes. so it's a region. So you have. I didn't realise different terms for the same thing. Yeah, we've got it the wrong way round. Is there is there any money in giant vegetable growing, Joe? Well, it's the same as any hobby. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not win anything for your giant turnip? Yes, then? yes. You, you can't win money at the shows, but right. it, 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 you'll never get back what you've spent. Okay. What did you get for your turnip? Well, I didn't, because I only took it there to confirm a world record. Oh, there okay. wasn't actually a class in the show. Okay. What, what, did, what did it cost you to produce this turnip, then? Well, I had a, I had a six-metre pipe, which was full of very, very good compost. OK, homemade compost, presumably. Uh, no. Oh, <laughs> shop-bought, right, OK. Yeah, shop-bought, riddled. OK. Um, it, it costs more in time. Right. How many, how many hours do you think you spent on your turnip? Well, you, you can't specifically say one veg. I mean, I grew it and my wife cleaned it. Right. That's, that's, that's pretty much how it works at my house as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, your turnip growing operation? You yeah, know yeah well, no, no, yeah. no. I grow it and the wife cleans it. It was, a sort of, it was just that statement there. That, oh, okay. that, that's what we do at home. Um, is there a vegetable that you've yet to grow to massive proportions but you hope to do one day? Uh, well, everyone. You want you want to win them all? Yeah. OK, OK. And can I... This is... I know that with... Um, certainly with fish, that just because a, a fish is bigger doesn't necessarily mean it tastes better... Do big turnips taste as nice as little turnips? Good question. Thank you. Well, I see, I've only grown it for length. The turnip itself isn't very big, but it is long. Oh, uh, well, I do grow giant onions and leeks, and okay. there's no difference. 
uh, but, a normal onion and a normal leek. So that the taste is just as just as strong, just as sharp with a massive onion as a small one. I don't know about onions. I don't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what, what problems? <laughs> just get this right, you don't like vegetables, is that right, Joe? Or you just don't no, like I onions? I didn't say that. <laughs> I don't like onions. I like carrots. I just don't like onions. <laughs> Do, what problems can you encounter? What what uh, might ruin your attempt to slugs. grow a massive, great uh, uh, vegetable? Like, as Matthew said, slugs, weather, what? Yeah, it's been poor weather this year. There's loads of things. The vegetable can rot. Uh, pests, the weather, there's loads of things. So, wait a minute, today, you said it was, it's been a lousy year. Is that because it was mainly dry and then all the rain came at the end? Well, early on, February, March time, we had that red-hot spring. Right. Yeah, 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 that wonderful. Oh, yeah, I came that. and it was dark, dull and wet. And that's what did for him. Yeah. Uh, just out of interest, all the um, champion vegetable growers that I have spoken to over the years have been men. Is that, are there women in the in the game as well? Well, if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't have the long bed. Oh. So it's a oh. teamwork. <laughs> it's it's a team effort. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, What's happened to the turnip now? Yes, where is the turnip? What's happened to it? I left it on the show bench. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's get this right. You dedicate a whole year to growing massive vegetables. You you win a world record with your turnip, and then you just left it there you and just went walk home. off and leave it. Yeah, well, once it's measured and verified and sent to Guinness World Records, that's it. It's done its job. <laughs> Is it? Because I, I would have thought it had been. I mean, no, no joke. I mean, my, I look at my old motorbikes. I'm into vintage bikes, and I, I think of them as, in some degree, as my children. Have you given your? Have you given a year of your life to growing this turnip? I would have thought you'd have formed. Something of an emotional attachment to it, but no, it's just a vegetable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Joe, Joe Atherton, I can honestly say I think this is my favourite curiosity corner of the last 12 months, and um, possibly because uh, you're the first 12 time world record holder we've ever had on the show. Now, everyone knows Locksmiths Timpsons do an amazing job offering work to ex cons, but now the firm's story is being committed to the silver screen. We spoke to director Rex Bloomstein and also to one of the film's stars, convicted murderer Anthony McGovern. I went on a therapy unit just to take boxes at first, being completely yeah. honest. Uh, but something just uh, clicked in me. Uh, I started to get to know uh, myself. I started to uh, uh, experience all these new feelings. And uh, it came to me uh, that I wanted to, I wanted to change and I wanted to get out of prison. Uh, I punished myself for a lot, a lot of years uh, for what I'd done, uh, and, uh, and, and it felt nice to punish myself because that's what yeah. I thought I deserved at the time. Yeah. Nobody was willing to give me a chance, and uh, with, with each and every knockback, uh, I started to feel all those feelings again yeah. that I don't deserve this and blah blah blah. But today it's completely different. It's t like I've been out of prison for five years now. Tell us uh, about Timpsons, how, how they how they sort of reached out to you, how you've developed uh, alongside them. Uh, absolutely fantastically. Uh, I can tell you a little part. I did go, go back on. to prison after I saved my life sentence. I went back to prison on a false allegation. I was working for Timpsons at the time. And uh, one of James's colleagues uh, kept my job open for me, which is an area manager on a on another area, and when I got out of prison, my job was there for me, wow. so it gave me a lot of hope. So you've got to have your own art in it. Uh, if you want to change in life, well, you've got so to have your own art in it. Uh, yeah. Everything inside the prison system is there to help you to rehabilitate. Everything's there in place uh, to make you a better person so you don't come out and commit crime again. Uh, you have so many uh, useful courses in prison, like offending behaviour courses, and it's how you... Uh, it's how you progress on those. If you want to change deep within yourself, um, which I wanted to, uh, that change just came. Okay. And he saw everything as in prison, set up in prison for to rehabilitate people. And finally, with a name like his, did poker champ Chris Moneymaker have any other destiny than to win it big at cards? Um, it's a lot with, you know, business or anything. You, you have to... Uh, observe the landscape and then wait and then when the opportunity presents itself you go for it full bore and the poker face yeah, bit? is there such a thing as the poker face of course there's a poker face i mean Do, you give know, us you... your poker face it's good for radio 
Dear God, that's, yeah, you, you all saw that, that is right? Good. Yeah. That is yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, a, just as you, it's kind of just as you imagine. Actually, it's everything just drops down, and you, you offer no emotional clue. I suppose the trick is to offer no emotional cl clue when inside you're either waiting to punch the air thinking, I can't believe I've got four kings, or, oh, my God, I've got three high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of two things. It's one, you're either dead in yourself or, like, you know, someone like yourself who's got a really animated face, yeah. you're going you're gonna to have to be animated all the time. Yeah. You can't really just deaden your face, so you're going to have to act... Like They're this. laughing at me. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> They're laughing at me. <laughs> You're going to have to act this way all the time. You're just acting on yourself. That's but not you... a problem. <laughs> yeah. No. To, to, uh, uh... When you play, I don't know how many players play in a big game. Anywhere between eight to ten. I mean, is it, can, you, can you predict the hands? You count the cards? Are you able to do that? You can't. Uh, blackjack counting the cards. What you do in poker is you watch when people look at their cards, and people, when they look at their cards, uh, generally they'll look at them for longer periods of time based on what they have. So when they look at them for a couple seconds, they have a medium type hand because they're trying to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. If they have really good cards or really bad cards, they will usually look at them really fast and put them down. Once they put them down, a lot of times they'll pull them closer to them, they'll push them away from them, they'll oh, put a chip on top of them. Um, they'll pick them up to like throw them in pr Lying. prematurely. So you pick up all this information. And then obviously once you know they decide what they're gonna do, they, they put out what's called a flop and there's three cards. And if you watch what and how each individual responds to that flop, They'll, they'll glance down at their cars, they'll glance over at you. If you're at a very talkative table, they'll be real quiet for a while. Um, so you use all this information and you build player profiles and you build um, ways to extract money from people. Have, and, you, have you ever won millions of bucks uh, bluffing with a bad hand? Well, that, that's actually, you know, the, the first uh, tournament I ever played, the one that I won, it was called the Bluff of the Century. Go on. I, I, uh, <laughs> Go on. I bluffed with King High. We were heads up uh, going for the championship. And uh, on the river, I had nothing, and my opponent had a pair. And I knew he was weak and ended up pushing them all in. If I get called right there, I'm not sitting in this room talking to you guys. I'm back in Tennessee, <laughs> an accountant somewhere, and he might be in this booth. Right. Um, and this is going to sound like a dumb question, but... Is it stressful? Because I'm thinking, we start off, it's a game. I used to play with my old man. He was very good too many years in Hong Kong uh, in the forces, but he was really good. And he was perfectly in control. I was stressy because I was just losing all the time. So what kind of a, a lifestyle is it? It's actually a pretty good lifestyle. I mean, I, I'm a little bit different in the fact that I go around and I promote the game a lot, and I'm, I'm here in London doing that right now. Um, when I go and I play a 10K event and we get deep, yeah, there's some stress to it, but it's also a lot of adrenaline. How much stress? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it, it depends on the person. See, I like the stress. I like the pressure. I'm, I've always liked that. But some people don't like it, and it, it's definitely uncomfortable. It takes some getting used to, and... You know, it's kind of like if you're playing golf and you're standing over a putt for a lot of money, some people mentally crack under that pressure and some people thrive. Now, Jenny Trent Hughes is staying very quiet, but some <laughs> listeners... She's with, got her poker face with, on. With very, yeah. with very good memories and a Sky TV subscription back in the day will have seen you compete in celebrity poker, as I recall, Jenny. Well, I am. I'm laughing listening to <laughs> listening because now I understand why I'm so rubbish at it. Because what? I, because I, you know, I get cards and I go, "Oh, look, everybody, look what I have." <laughs> Our women. Are we, have, women. we have an open seat, by the way. <laughs> exactly. We have um, a very famous poker player over here, uh, who's also a very famous TV presenter and writer, a huge brain, Victoria Corin Mitchell. She won uh, a million, a million, and a, rest, a million and a rest uh, in, in one of her first competitions. Have you ever met? Her? Is, is she? Uh, are women any good at poker? Is, is it? Is there a gender bias in the game? Well, of course, she's really good at poker. She was uh, a team pro with me. We worked okay. together for uh, okay. you know, several years. She was on Team Poker Stars Pro with myself, and we would travel around and we would play the circuit together. We would do a lot of interviews together. Um, women are fantastic at poker. The the problem is it's really hard for a woman to sit down at a table with nine or ten guys. And it used to be when you would go to a poker tournament. It would be about 95% male and then just a few percent women. Well, that's changed over the years. There are more and more women coming into the game. Is there a difference where you are uh, on the planet? Because I know um, I'm in the big into fly fishing and in America, women fly fishers, very, very common. In the UK, still comparatively rare. Are the US ahead of the game here? Yeah, the US is a little bit ahead of the game. But uh, in London, it's not very far, or UK is not very far behind. But when you go to like 
Brazil and some of the other the other countries, they're a little bit further behind on that on the the women coming in. Um, you know, women for the game are it's really difficult because I think women are very intuitive and very smart when it comes to reading situations and mm-hmm. reading people. I have a hard time lying to my wife, so um, <laughs> you know, I got that on record, right? <laughs> Thank you. So she, she's cracked your poker face. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't lie to mine. She just I've tried, and then yeah. I, she just looks at me. I just think, no, no, no. Okay, mm. I'm drunk. There we go. <laughs> Chris. Uh, okay, um, you're a Poker Stars ambassador and uh, you've been inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame. Obviously, a great ambassador for your uh, game, your sport. Uh, but we do have an increasing problem of gambling addiction. Does it worry you that the poker boom has contributed to that? Well, I mean, anything, you know, if you have a, a, a gambling problem or any kind of addiction, um, it's always going to be a problem that's already manifested itself a lot of times. Um, you know, gambling is a huge issue. It's a, Many people have gambling problems, but when it comes to poker, poker is a much slower game than the other games. It takes a lot of patience and, and waiting. It's, you don't get that instant gratification. So while there is going to people be people with gambling problems, it, they're going to tend to be more for the double up, you know, try and hit it fast and get money. Does the computer game? I was just about to say, is, is online the issue? Yeah, is that, that is yeah. that more of a problem? You know, the good thing about playing online is they really do have good tools to monitor how much you're losing, and they have stop restrictions, and they have ways to get help while you're playing online. So if you have some of those problems, they are very readily available. And they, Poker Stars, for example, has a whole department that's just focused on that. Can people see? I just out of interest. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it as a spectator sport, but. Do people come and watch you play? Are you playing over here? I'm playing over here in a little community um, over at Asper's Casino on the east side of town. Um, it's a little called Lex Live. It's a community environment. It's, it's, it's a smaller buy-in, so it's a $230 buy-in. I'm going to be there all week. And, uh, yeah, people can come in and watch and participate. You know, well, come in small... and play you. Play you. Yeah, of I'm course. Busy. Oh, I'm wow. busy all that week. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a pass on that. that. But, but the good thing is it's a 230-pound buy-in, and I'm going to be back here next month, actually. I'm going to go – I'm doing a tour of London – uh, starting October 24th, and it's a 140-pound buy-in, and we're giving away an extra $30,000 to the winner. Here's a deal, here's a deal. I'll do that if you come with me. I'll give you a tour of my favourite London pubs, and then we'll play Snap for Cash, 50p a go buy-in. What do you say? I don't even know what that is, but it sounds good to me. <laughs> Excellent. I'm on a winner! <laughs> Chris Moneymaker, fantastic ambassador for the uh, for the game.